We're delighted to be joined today by the Secretary of Education. That's right, you heard me, the Secretary of Education. Uh, Miguel Cardona is joining us today. And we have, I don't know how much time we have, but we are going to fix, would you like to fix elementary education today? Would you like to fix uh, high school education? Do you want to fix, uh, let's say, college? Where, 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 do you want to, where do you want to go here? Listen, all of the above, we signed up to do all of the above today. I, I know higher education is an issue of, of importance to many, many listeners, right. uh, everything that's going on. So we can focus there. But I'm listen, uh, elementary, uh, high school, pre-K, uh, higher education, whatever you Post choose. Post-K, detention. Uh, let, let me ask you this, Secretary. We have desperately tried to fix an education system that basically was designed for literacy, for the masses, and has been incredibly successful uh, on, on that goal. Uh, but it seems as though it's a bit stagnant and, and hasn't been able to be as agile as maybe uh, society now would, would need it to be. What would your diagnosis be for what you would change about it? Where do you, where do you see it working and, and where do you see it wanting? Sure, sure. Look, happy to be here. Love this topic, right? Um, I, I think in general, look, education has to evolve mm -hmm. or become irrelevant in, in our country. And we're not evolving at the pace that we need to evolve right. to compete internationally, to make sure that our students have access and opportunity, all students, not just some. Um, so, you know, it does work in many, in many ways. I mean, we have uh, some of the best higher education institutions in the world. Uh, the challenge is it's not really open and they're not pathways for all students. So what we need to do is make sure that we're providing better pathways. And I'm gonna expand that a little bit, not only higher education, because I think there's a mentality in this country of four years or bust, four year colleges are bust. Mm -hmm. There are so many opportunities now in our two year schools and even in our K-12 system or pre-K-12 system, uh, getting credentials or micro credentials and joining the workforce in high skill, high paying jobs. So when I say we need to evolve, I, I think our pre-K-12 system needs to evolve, our higher education system needs to evolve, to be more connected to the opportunities that exist in this country and beyond uh, for all of our students. I, li I like the idea of micro-credentials. I, I think that, I think, I think mini-credentials, micro-credentials, whatever, whatever tiny credentials you could have. And you could even make tiny diplomas for everybody yeah. that gets them, like little <laughs> That's stamps. That's the plan. That, They're little that, small that printers. That you put on. So <laughs> let me tell you, so my, my kids are, uh, a senior in high school and a, and a junior in high school. And, and they're very fortunate to go to a, a really nice school and a really nice place and all those different things. Uh, and my mother was a teacher for, I think, 186 years. Uh, she taught, uh, and she reminds me of that uh, on almost every, on a daily basis. What's interesting to me about education is the teachers, I think, feel disassociated from it in that they're, the idea is they're teaching to kind of standardize testing, that so much of, of what they have to do is based on a testing regimen that's attempting to uh, assess students on certain standardizations. But I think, as you know, that doesn't work for all students right. in all communities. What I've noticed about their enthusiasm for learning is the more relevance subjects have to the actual world that they live in, but it's a really difficult thing for teachers to pull that off because so much of their time has to be spent on boiling things down to this standardized box that everybody is placed in. You know, we've had a fascination mm -hmm. in this country with standardized assessments and unfortunately, in many places, we lost our way and we lost students in the process. We're overly enamored with uh, misusing those data and labeling schools and putting scarlet letters on districts that are working twice as hard to meet the needs of students. John, when I was a school principal, I had this young girl from the Dominican Republic mm -hmm. come into the school where I, uh, where I was serving. She was about nine years old. Uh, she was learning English, very little English. Mm -hmm. um, 
she had exceptionality. So she had a an IEP, uh, and I understand your mother was a special education she was. teacher. So, you know, it, it might have been a student that your mom might have supported. Right. So the day of the assessment, I remember this young girl sobbing. I had to go visit her because I was one of the few in the school that spoke Spanish. Mm -hmm. She was sobbing in fear that this test in a foreign language was being put in front of her. And those data were going to be used to determine in many ways what she's capable of. We've done that too much in this country. And what the school is capable of. I mean, probably the, the funding of the school was reliant on this. I'll take it a step further. Yep. When those data came out, John, we had many students who were bilo in bilingual education program who didn't dominate English yet. Right. So the school was classified as a school in need of improvement, or as some would call it, a failing school. Right. So now I had to defend to the community. No, these students are learning the language. It doesn't mean that they're not capable. Um, but it became, I had one person ask me, is it because of those kids? Think about what it did for the school community. Think wow. about what it did for that little girl. Right. So we've become overly enamored with, util with using the test for things that it's not intended to use. So my alternative, my, my thought is, how about we have a, a quality curriculum and have performance-based tasks in the curriculum? Have formative assessments that actually inform instruction on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I look at the standardized test as an autopsy, right? It's an autopsy of what was learned. But can you do that from a, a, a national level? Isn't it, you know, isn't isn't the battle here? You've got local control, which is sort of the tradition of, of American education, and right. then you've got federal standards imposed on that, which are gonna naturally group people in, in wildly uh, divergent circumstance. So how does the federal government then, because you've seen it from both sides, how do they then assess those uh, tests for local communities while also empowering the local communities to understand best what their population is all about? Yeah, it's, it's worth repeating because a lot of times people don't uh, realize that we have a, a decentralized system in the United States, and that's I right. think that's a good thing. Right. You know, states are responsible for education. And I came from Connecticut, right? Small, small Connecticut. Mm -hmm. There were 169 municipalities there with 169 different boards of education determining curriculum that's right. and standards. As a commission of education, we had, uh, you know, oversight of uh, student success around uh, some standardized assessment. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think that's a, necessarily a bad thing because right now I'm using those data to determine where the American Rescue Plan dollars should be going, right. but we shouldn't be putting all of our eggs in that basket. And I think unfortunately, in parts of our country, we do that. So what we're trying to do is not only look at the standardized assessments that states are doing, but talking about good pedagogy and how to get kids engaged naturally and how do you assess that, right? right. Sometimes I think the cart is uh, before the horse. We shouldn't be leading with assessment. We should be leading with good instruction and having authentic assessment follow that. Does it make it difficult because, you know, you know, every four years we switch administrations and the, you know, the, the education department and all those kinds of things change over and they, they go into different directions. And so all the things that you're talking about take time. And by the time you maybe have done your assessment and you're ready to maybe implement some changes on there, you're gone. And the new administration comes in and, and, and they check over. Is there a broader construct that the Department of Education could take where they're looking at things maybe with uh, less specifics and, and more purpose? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, absolutely. Just like everything else, there's a pendulum swinging, right, in education? That's right. We're seeing it now with the reading wars, right? Um, but for me, our approach at the Department of Education is not to... Um, do something and, and hope it sticks. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is, is bring in different stakeholders, right? right? Different perspectives so that the ideas that come out of this has shared ownership. Uh, red and blue, rural, urban. Uh, it's really important that, you know, in education, we should be unified around helping children. And, and by and large, that's what we have. So the, the development of the policies and the practices should outlast me as secretary. Right. And the the impact, the positive impact 
should outlast me as secretary. So we've been very intentional to try to bring in different perspectives, talk to both sides of the aisle, and really come together around what we believe is the best way to move forward. And so, so what are the what are the complaints like? What when when they come to you, is it just hey, uh, secretary, we could use more money? You know, I, I can assume everybody needs more money, but we do have a lot of money within the system. But let's say they come up to you with their what are they asking you for? Are they asking you to back off? Are they just asking you for money? The different districts and superintendents and uh, uh, state uh, heads of education, what do, they, what do they want from you? First of all, I, I can't get into this response without saying mm -hmm. how, how inspired I've been by our educators, um, our leaders, and I'm talking bus drivers, cafeteria, uh, staff, custodians who have had to deal with cleaner air and, and updating systems, right. school leaders who have really worked to try to navigate some of the division in their communities, board members. So, you know, I tip my hat to these folks, um, but what they're saying to me is, look, we know what our kids need. We need some autonomy. Right. We need clarity around what practices are the best. Right. And we need funding to support that. And let me give you an example if I could. Yeah. Right? All you hear about in September and October was teacher shortages, right? Everywhere. There's teacher shortages everywhere. Sure. Yet, when we get back into the routine of things, that kind of goes by the wayside, but we haven't addressed the issue. We Our, our educators are overworked. Right. They're expected to fix every issue. That's right. And they're getting paid much less than people with degrees in other fields. That's right. And we've normalized this, John. Right. For decades, we've normalized this. That's right. And then we're expected. So now COVID hits. And sadly, over 200,000 children are returning to school with, without a parent or caregiver because they've lost them due to COVID. And now we expect our teachers to be trauma-informed, right. right? No additional training. Um, you know, and, and whatever training they get, they get during their work day and they're expected to become experts. So what, what I'm hearing from the field is just acknowledge how hard we're working, how difficult it is mm -hmm. to be at the crosshairs of so much divide and, and um, you know, you know, there's a lot of anxiety and frustration out there. And just acknowledge us, uh, support us, and make sure we have the tools. But they're not fighting for themselves, they're fighting for their kids, they're fighting for their students. Right. If we support teachers, we support students. No, it's all, listen, every, everything that you're saying is, is correct. I mean, it, it's teachers and schools are, in every community that they're in are meant to fill in all the different gaps of, of that community. For instance, if you're in a school where poverty and insecurity is a big issue, well, that school is then called upon to be not just a place of education, but a place of nourishment and a place of uh, these kids are gonna come in and they're also gonna get. If you're in a, a school district where there's high crime or chaos, the school is meant to be a place of uh, calm and up and the teachers there have to be Swiss army knives when it comes to whatever ill is facing that community. So that, that, that goes without saying we don't pay. It was the same idea in the pandemic. We learned who the real essential workers were in our economy. The issue I have, and, and it's the thing that I think bedevils so much of education is what then is the purpose of these schools? Is it straight literacy? Is it to be the backstop of every social ill that affects that community in that time? And if so, how can the teachers possibly have the skill sets to be the, the, the panacea to all those ills? Right. No, that's a, that's a great question. And look, we have an antiquated mindset. Mm-hmm of schools, and that's why I say we need to evolve. So yes, literacy and numeracy, uh, STEM, mm -hmm. um, that's critically important for our teachers. That, that They are the ones that the buck stops with them, right? However, if a child's tooth hurts when they go to school, right. that's gonna affect their ability to learn. If a child's stomach is grumbling, that's gonna affect their ability to learn. If they're concerned about where they're gonna sleep at night, that's gonna affect their bandwidth for learning, right? right? Now, it's unfair to expect the classroom teacher to solve all that. We need to have schools with the right tools. But we do. And not only that, now we're gonna arm them 
and make them no, our, our not, kids' bodyguards. Look. But you, you know my point. My point is basically that these sure. teachers have to go in there, solve all these social ills, and also are expected to give up their lives if necessary, whether uh, it yeah. be through the pandemic or through uh, gun violence. So I, I guess I'm referring back to when you said there's a teacher shortage. I don't know how a system could create individuals, forget about even at that pay scale, who can handle all the right. things that we ask of teachers and educators. It doesn't Absolutely. make sense. Absolutely. But that's why, you know, what we're doing is not saying teachers, we're going to give you more. And it's it's about giving the right tools, mm -hmm. right? More school social workers. The uh, the Safer Communities Act provided over a billion dollars for more social workers. So that teacher right. whose child is sad or, or dealing with some issues has a social worker right down the hallway. Mm -hmm. we, we've invested uh, 400, or we're, we're putting in our proposal for our budget, $400 million for community schools so that we could have more clinics so that when students are not well, they can get the support that they need, the health support that they need. So they could be in the classroom ready to learn and the classroom teacher could focus on right. uh, literacy and numeracy. So what we're trying to do is build out a new definition of what effective schools are. Right. And there are schools that are meeting the whole needs of the child, but not placing it squarely on the shoulders of the classroom teachers, which is how the model was set up. And, and the Biden-Harris administration is really pushing for that. That's right. And it's also not just what's effective schools, but what are effective communities and what's the school's role within that? And exactly. certain schools are going to play a larger role in communities of need because there's so much more that, that needs to be done there. And yet so much of what we do in terms of funding is just based on the numbers. What is your standardized testing scores? What are your right. different things? It doesn't take into account the various headwinds that so many schools have to face that also affect their testing. And we penalize them if they don't do that. So the second part of the question is, once we determine what an effective community is versus an effective school, then you get to the real core issue here, which is what is the purpose of the curriculum in a school? What are they trying to do? Because as it's been standardized over these years, it's gotten, society is evolving at a much more agile pace than curriculum. I think if you look at schools today, they probably closer hue to Horace Mann than they do to Steve Jobs and, and what this new economy is. How do, you, how do you evolve the purpose of schools and make them more relevant and again, this is where I think at the at the federal role, while we don't we don't really uh, we don't dictate, we don't mandate, we don't mm -hmm. pr promote a specific curriculum. We recognize states' role is to do that. What we're saying is, you need to modernize, you need to evolve, you need to understand the fact that students are sitting in our high schools uh, in the same way that they did a hundred years ago. Right. When we have internship opportunities, we have career pathways that could be explored in ninth grade. John, my, my own children, they were in high school during the uh, height of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. They, uh, you know, the first three or four months, everything was shut down. The following year, they went in in a hybrid fashion, which I would imagine many kids across right, the country Right, right, my kids too. So my children went to school Monday, Wednesday, Friday on A week, mm -hmm. Tuesday, Thursday on B week. Right. And guess what? They were able to function that year that way. Mm -hmm. When we got through the worst part of the pandemic, they went back to school and now they're in the same model. I'm encouraging leaders to say, use that hybrid model, but instead of the students being home, let's have them out in the field doing externships, doing internships for credits. Um, let's let them see how the math skills that they're learning on Monday, Wednesday, Friday right. can be applied in these careers. But doesn't that have to be modeled Who's providing the model for that? You know, I, I almost look at, this is going to sound like a, a strange example, but, you know, I look at these uh, IMG Academy sort of uh, schools that look at kids that have exceptional abilities in athletics. And so they'll take the kids and, you know, from nine to 12, they'll do, uh, you know, uh, some more academic stuff. But in the mornings, they'll do some training. And then uh, later in the afternoon, they'll really work on uh, the sport that, that they're really in. Who's creating those models for not athletic prowess, but civic prowess or, uh, you know, internships or community prowess? 
or those things, those models have to be developed, whether it's through pilot programs or through other things, so that these schools, which are already so strapped for resources and so strapped, have something to look towards that they can implement. And how do we do that? So uh, we're announcing in January, unlocking career success. It's like a GPS system for students mm-hmm. uh, to promote pathways. I was in Chicago recently with uh, Marty Walsh, uh, Department of Labor Secretary, at Rolling Meadows School, mm. where they had really deep tentacles into the community, into the businesses. As a matter of fact, the business leaders were a part of the school planning process. They were planning the curriculum. It was like backwards mapping, right? Uh, Who do they need to hire? And what skills do they need? And how are the schools uh, working with them to make sure students have real life experiences Mm -hmm. in the school and then out into the field? Models exist. John, but we have pockets of excellence in our country. Mm -hmm. We need to systematize this. And um, I'm really excited because this is a purple issue, John. You know, both sides of the aisle believe in this. What we're trying to do now is elevate those best practices, put some funding toward it, and make sure that it's aligned to the Chips and Science Act. Make sure it's aligned to the climate provisions under the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, to the infrastructure plan where there's high skilled, high paying jobs available. You know, what I would imagine is is so important is, is for us to redefine what going through that system is right now, because there's an awful lot of redundancy in it. There's an awful lot mm-hmm. of busy work in it. There's an awful lot of things that don't make sense to the students or the teachers alike, because they're geared towards you know, this idea of standardized testing. And then they move into a higher education system where the opening bid to just get into it can be 100,000, 150,000, $200,000. And the return on investment for an engineering degree is very different than the return on investment on maybe an art history degree, but they cost the same. And they last four years where you could probably do it in, you know, in two. So our, our, our whole system feels like it is rife with not fraud, but waste. Yeah. And, and and a lack of direction. It, it's really protecting the status quo. Right. And it's not centered around students. It's not centered, no, it's centered around, around the industry that's come up around right. education. Yeah, yeah. So what we're trying to do is fix a broken system in the pre-K-12 space, right. making it more relevant, making it more connected to life outside of those four walls. Right. Um, and in higher education, let me tell you, John, like some of the proudest uh, work uh, we have going on here is breaking up a system that I was told you can't touch higher ed. That, that, you're not going to be able to touch that. You know, and we're we're working on we're forty eight billion dollars in uh, approved debt relief, two million borrowers. We're we're talking about return on investment in colleges, and I'm not just talking about your Corinthians or your ITTs. I'm talking about your public schools too. Right. If you're having students pay one hundred fifty thousand dollars for an education that's going to get them a job making forty thousand dollars a year, we're going to call you out. I don't care if you're a prestigious university. I don't care if you're public or private. Like we need to do better. And we're, we're working on creating that culture. We're working on elevating those institutions that provide upward mobility, upward mobility uh, for students, you know, as opposed to Xeroxing privilege uh, in some of the universities where exclusivity gets them higher rankings. Like, we're done with that. Mm-hmm. We need a change. We need it, a culture shift. Is the first step here, and, you know, and you hate to go back to these kind of bills of rights things, but, you know, a student bill of rights or those types of things, but is there a document that you work off of that basically states the purpose of of what you believe education should be uh, right now, because everything that you're talking about, it it makes sense, but I worry, you know, two years from now, you're not gonna be here, and without anything concrete, these are all just aspirational and and really general. (laughs) One thing I learned, when I got here, because I'm a I'm a practitioner, man. I, you know, I I know kids. And that's where right. I, I I love being in schools. I love being around students. But what I learned here is that there are uh, policy revision processes that often take a year, or two years, because we go through the public hearing, and then they become new policies. Right. Um, and that will outlast me. Uh, we work on legislative proposals uh, that will outlast me. And yes, I mean, we take every opportunity to stand up 
and talk about the values that should be driving education. We choose where the money goes with some of these discretionary grants, um, and we're focusing on supporting college completion programs, um, career pathway programs in our K-12 system, and working with our leaders across the country, our state education chiefs, our governors, our state legislators, to help build capacity around where we need to go in education. And uh, as I said before, like, I'm proud of the work that they're doing. Um, we have to keep our foot on the gas, and we have to maintain, John, a level of urgency around right. this work like we had when we were trying to open schools two years ago. I'm gonna ask um, you one last question because yeah. I know uh, you got to run and we very much appreciate your time. You've seen it from the retail level of being inside schools and you've seen it from the federal level. And I guess my question is, do you see this as a top down or as a bottom up uh, thing? And is there a, a, a question of what does the federal government do well for schools and what does it not do well at all and really should take a backseat to helping uh, from the, the grassroots and, and the bottom up. And that'll that'll be my final. <laughs> Thanks, John. So look, top down, bottom up. We need bottom up approaches to mm -hmm. fuel the innovation, uh, but we need top down support, right? I, my policies have to allow for those bottom up strategies that may not be conventional. Um, and, and you need people in DC fighting because they're listening to the voices of our students right. and our educators and right. our parents right. across the country. So I think top down, bottom up, they have to meet in the middle. Um, what we're doing well is number one, we're calling out the discrimination against certain marginalized students in a way that needs to be called out. Um, we're fighting to make sure that schools are like, Two years ago, schools were safely reopened, right? We went from 47% of them uh, opened full-time mm -hmm. when the president took office to about 90% uh, seven, eight months later. So we're fighting for the things that are right and we're protecting students who are being marginalized or are pushed aside. What we need to do better is empower the voices of our students, empower the voices of our parents uh, to make sure that their voice is at the table when decisions are being made at the local and state level. And we're gonna to continue to do that. Right. Well, I very much uh, appreciate you taking the time. Uh, Secretary Cardona, good luck, good luck uh, with your kids in Thank school, you. as uh, I know they're probably heading off to their uh, higher education, yeah. all those things. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, Same take, to you, John. Great to see you again. Thanks so much. Great to see you as well. Take care of yourself. Whew. All right. We are back. Kason and Dennis, uh, yeah. I'm glad you see. Here's, here's the problem. Okay. But, uh, lovely man. Yes. Very bright. I don't doubt his sincerity. They were all fine statements of intent. But at some point, we got to fucking get to brass tacks and get... I, I we, we, They're very smart people on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> that's what... You know, my favorite thing to hear is when people say things are purple issues. <laughs> this is a purple issue. You're talking about education. Purple. What about healthcare? Purple. You know what I love about this podcast, John? What's that? I feel like... Two weeks ago, you made sure your dog was okay. And yes. then this week, you make sure your kids are okay. I feel like you just make... <laughs> you're just using this podcast to ensure... <laughs> you're just here to make sure your house is fine. It's going to be a carpenter on next week. It's not going to get fixed. How would you guys... Did, were you frustrated by your educations? I am frustrated for my children watching how little what they learn has to do with the world they're about to enter. Right. I'm frustrated for them. So what's the difference between what you've noticed as an adult and then what you know now as a parent in terms of how you interact with the education system? You mean when I was going through it versus now? Yeah, now that your kids are like school age and now okay. you're thinking about college, like how's, how's that changed? So that's, that's a great question. It's the exact same fucking system. Yeah. That's what's so frustrating. I'm an old man, and it's the same system as it was when my parents were coming up through it. And that's the part that's so frustrating because the world is so different. And I see the difference in their enthusiasm and their when, when there's relevance when it's applied learning versus learning, it's a whole different game. And there's still those things where they go in and it's like, remember, you know, you got to memorize the equation. You're like, I have Google. Like we live <laughs> right. in a different world. And I think we have to find a way to make education an applied skill and not, you know what I would do? And this sounds so ridiculous coming from 
a so-called, you know, progressive leaning, whatever I am, I would make the early grades more rope. Like kids, you fucking go play at home. You probably have a fort somewhere. Go play there. <laughs> right. You're going to probably peekaboo, hide and seek. You've got an imaginary friend. You're going to dress up like Elsa, blah, blah, blah. Fine. A little, little nativity schmivity. While you're here, A, B, C, D, E. And then the switchover should be, and here's how shit works. And everything from there on in should be civics, uh, practicality, and how shit works. Yeah. So that... I want kids to understand the matrix. I don't want them to know the component parts. I want them to know the matrix. Uh, I have two things to say about that. One, my nephew, Caleb, is uh, 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And since he was in the first grade, he's been having socio-emotional classes in his school. What is that? Okay. So <laughs> it is... It is, it's, it's essentially therapy for children, but it's incredible. He is more mature emotionally than I am. But why does his school have that? And in, in it's a really great school in PG County, Maryland. And he's, he's developed, he gets straight A's, he's a great kid, but he's to the point now where uh, we'll be at home and he'll be like, Uncle K, I'm very disappointed in you, but I forgive you. I just want you to know I, I might need a second to reset, but I love you. Give me a hook. And I'm still over in the corner, like, <laughs> I'm still over in the corner, still going to therapy. As They're a giving them tools. See, that's a tool. It's, that's it's what school should be, tools. Yeah, yeah. A 100, 100 percent. School shouldn't just be time. It should be tools. And they don't give them enough tools. And I'm talking about financial tools, emotional tools, uh, uh, comprehension tools. They should be teaching kids how to discern good information from bad. That's almost the whole game. Tools. I'm hiring SBF to teach the finance class. <laughs> how do you feel about that? He's got time. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, where, where were you educated? Uh, so uh, in Turkey. And it's so funny to me because uh, they teach you 600 years of Ottoman history and you have to memorize every single war. And let me tell you, there are too many. <laughs> and I don't even remember a single one. You know what? Ever since Vietnam, we don't even count those wars. You don't even have to study those anymore. In America, it's basically, there was only, I think, two wars, the revolution and World War II. Other than that, it's just police actions. Just <laughs> right. different things that happen. Is is uh, uh, the education in Turkey practical or is it even more removed? Um, I mean, I don't have like experience with the American system, but it sounds like very similar. Mm -hmm. And I did go to an American high school. And okay. even that one, you know, it was like largely, you know, memorizing and like not really like super practical. Mm -hmm. But what's also crazy to me is like I went to private schools like my entire life, basically. Um, I was able to afford it. And like for college here, some rich person decided to pay for it. So I was able to go to college. Thank here. you, Oprah. <laughs> 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 well, you know, they like kind of like the more practical stuff is always like packaged as like, you know, when you buy something organic, it's like $2 more expensive. Mm -hmm. And then with like private schools, they call it like IB or like all of those things. Mm -hmm. And like, it's still like not really a good system, but it sounds fancy and sounds more practical, yeah. but it really isn't. And it's just like a scam for people to like pay more, basically. That's well, welcome. Welcome to America. That's, that's what we're doing. I'm putting out the call. So this is great guys, but I'm putting out the call on the podcast about education. I am inarticulate uh, about solutions and, and what I want, but what I want is a more clearly defined system of relevance to the world that we live in, to the challenges that people are going to be facing. And I want anyone out there who is listening, who has uh, an idea, a program they can point to some way. The only metrics that these kids are being judged on is standardized tests that have been made by an education corporation that has been uh, stuck in the mud for 50 fucking years uh, or academic rigor based on an industry of advanced placement that, like, ha again, has no connection to what's coming up. Let's design a system that is more uh, relevant, reactive, 
and that, that the metrics of which are the life that these children could aspirationally lead, not a resume that they are or a boilerplate that they're filling out to, to, to just get through. Let's change this thing. Ow! If, if Secretary Cardona says there is a model, I'd love to see it. <laughs> right.